know your who, because the fastest way to get to what you want or who or where you want is to find someone that already has it and ask for directions. I guess excited when I see pain because it's indicating I have something to learn, which means I'm going to grow, accelerate, but also I'm going to go to a better place, a better situation or make my situation better if I can learn that lesson. Money doesn't buy you happiness or love, but it allows you to shop. If you shop for the right things, you will be happy. Shop for the right things, have the right attitude, have the right values. And I promise you, you'll be prepared for that future. Today's guest is a legend in the world of sports marketing. He's the co-founder of Sports One Marketing, and he formerly served as the CEO of Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment, which was the inspiration for the movie Jerry Maguire. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Okay, he's been recognized by Variety Magazine as Sports Humanitarian of the Year, awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, and he's also the executive producer of the brand new Bloomberg and Amazon Prime Television series, Two Minute Drill. Not only that, he's working to empower over one billion people to be happy. Please help me welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast, David Meltzer. Evan Carmichael, I know that you've worked with him for, for a while now. I, I've known him for 15 years. We're, we're very, very good friends. And so I'm actually super excited to meet you finally because I've seen all of your videos. I've, I've watched all the connections. I know you guys are partnering on some game stuff together. And so finally, I get to meet the man who I've heard so much about. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. And tell Evan I said hello. He's one of my favorite people. I will do that. I'm talking to him in 25 minutes after, right oh, cool. after you. So I will pass that along. So anyway, real quick. So typically on the We Do Hard Things podcast, we want to focus on the moments where people face the hardest things of their past. And while we could spend a bit of time on your past, actually, you know, you are the game time decision maker, right? You wrote the book Game Time Decision Makers. I feel like right now, the moment we're in right now is so important that we do the right steps so that way in the future, we can face the hard things that we know we're going to all have to face. And so I spent all my time looking back, looking back, looking back, but I have you and you are so well connected. You're going to help a billion people. You're going to help a billion entrepreneurs hit their goals in the future. So, so if I can, can we just have a conversation about what we need to be doing right now to prepare ourselves as business people, as entrepreneurs, as leaders, so we can do the hard things we need to do in the future? I love it. And I'll tie it right into my past for two seconds. So we'll, we'll hit both things that you like to hit and knock it out of the park. Does that sound fair? Perfect. Let's, let's, let's go. So what do you think? I mean, I do want to just focus on the future if I can, but, but we'll circle around to the past. So in terms of the hardest things that you've had to face in your life, I know I, most of us know your story and it's remarkable. What were some of the hardest things that you had to face that helped put you on the path to where you are today and what you're doing in the future? Yeah, I think it applies to preparing yourself for the future because for me, it was understanding that I had lost my values, right? I had lost my values and, you know, I was a multimillionaire in my 20s coming from nothing. So I faced the normal challenges of being poor uh, growing up, single mom, six kids, all of that. Then now I face the uh, journey of finding humility and not losing the character and values that got me there. And I did. And that was the biggest challenge. And it prepared me for the future. And when I say that, people ask me, where did you bottom out? I said, two years before I lost $100 million and went bankrupt. They're like, whoa, say that again? Because usually people say I bottomed out and I lost everything. I bottomed out two years before I lost everything. I was actually prepared for my future of losing everything, having to tell my mom not only that I went bankrupt, but I lost her house because I didn't put her house in her name. I had so many different ego issues and character and value issues that I had to work through, which leads me to today because obviously so many people are faced uh, with number one, an anomaly, they talk about an uncertain future. Let me dispel that anomaly for everyone. The future is uncertain. So don't tell me, whine to me, cry to me about, oh my gosh, there's so much uncertainty. Because if anybody out there, including our friend Evan Carmichael, who you're going to speak to later today, 
if he knows what's going to happen for sure tomorrow, if you can just tell me one certain thing that's going to happen tomorrow, I can make billions of dollars and I'll share it with charity and with you. I don't care. I don't even want the money. There's no certainty, but what is there? There's change. There's change. And right now we're facing accelerated change. So what do we do to prepare for that accelerated change? Number one, like I did to prepare for my future, take inventory of your values. Mm. For me, I'm living with uh, taking stock in gratitude because I have control of my perspective. I have control of my mindset. I have control of a muscle that allows me to find the light the love and the lessons in everything. Pain is not a stop sign for Dave Meltzer. Pain, it's a turn signal. I get excited when I see pain because it's indicating I have something to learn, which means I'm gonna grow, accelerate, and, and ex exponentially grow and accelerate, but also I'm gonna go to a better place, a better situation or make my situation better if I can learn that lesson. So gratitude as a value and perspective as a component of that value allows me to be happy where I'm at, hmm. right? Happy, I'm at the right place at the perfect time, but it also allows me to angle through all of the pain, keep angling through the turn signals to what I want and gratitude also gives me the faith I'm gonna end up somewhere better. And I have complete control of my mindset and my perspective. I have complete control of my gratitude. Two, forgiveness. Forgiveness brings me peace. So many people, look, they worry. You know what worrying is? It's wishing for what you don't want. And the minute you understand that I can forgive myself for all the things I don't know, I can forgive myself for acting in areas and ways that I didn't want to. I can forgive myself and even better than forgiving myself, I can give it to other people, not because they deserve it, but because I deserve to have less resistance, void shortages and obstacles in my life. I deserve peace in my life, which is the efficient flow between me and everything else in the world. The third thing that we need to do to prepare ourselves for the future that prepared me to lose over a hundred million dollars and walk out and within weeks make another million dollars and be at peace and happy and help other people and elevate myself in that direction is accountability, which was extremely hard for me because not only had I lived so long below the line of accountability and blame, shame and justification, but I was a lawyer. So I was trained in liability, which is blame, shame, and justification. But the minute that I freed myself and took control, even during periods of accelerated change and growth, even during the pandemic, when I took accountability and said to myself, what did I do to attract this to my life? And what am I supposed to learn from it? Through gratitude, forgiveness, and accountability, I learned the difference between motivation which so many people need every day. Motivation is the ability to get up, get back up, get started and get back started. But I learned about inspiration, the ability to get me there. Inspiration is the reminder that we already are healthy. We already are wealthy. We already are happy. And we just have to shift our paradigm and focus through gratitude, forgiveness, and accountability. What are we doing to interfere with what we already have? Don't go out and search for it. You already have it. Figure out what you're doing to interfere with it. And that will inspire you, not allow you to be a victim living in a world of liability below the line, in a world where everything happens to you you're a victim, why me? Then there's another world, you don't have to live in this either, the world of for me, buying things you don't need to impress people you don't even like. Money doesn't buy you happiness or love, but it allows you to shop. And if you shop for the right things with the abundant philosophy of gratitude, forgiveness, and accountability, living in spirit in a world of more than enough of everything for everyone coming through you, if you shop for the right things, you will be happy. And so money can allow you to shop, shop for the right things, have the right attitude, have the right values. And I promise you, you'll be prepared for that future. 
I love it. I love it so much. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's funny. I had a business coach uh, a bunch of years ago and I told him, listen, I know the things I'm chasing are the wrong things, but I, I want to get them so I can then confirm that they're the wrong things. Like, like I want, I want, I know I shouldn't be chasing money, but I want the money and then I'll learn the lesson. It's easy for Jim Carrey to say like, you don't need money when you have it. It's easy for you to say, you know, focus on gratitude or focus on this or that because you've lived on both sides of it. How do people like me right size this? I know I shouldn't want it, but, but I, I, I still want it, man. I still want it. Don't don't misinterpret me because I you should have everything that you want and you should learn from it and you should ask yourself what do you know take a Ferrari for example I wanted a Ferrari so bad and I am so glad I've owned several in my life and I'm so glad I owned I own those Ferraris and I want everyone who wants a Ferrari as bad as I want a Ferrari to get it rapidly and accurately and learn from those Ferraris. So for me, I learned eventually from the Ferraris that they're expensive to keep uh, a take care of. You drive them too much, they break down. You drive them too little, they break down. You know, I thought everyone would love me because I had a Ferrari and respect me. No, piss people off and they didn't like me at all. Right. They thought I was an a-hole. And worse, I thought women would love me for having a Ferrari. All it did was expose my true anatomy to them. So it was kind of embarrassing. Right. I had some ego issues that were exposed when I had that Ferrari. So, you know, own everything you want to own. Lots of money, cars, houses, whatever. You should experience it. All I ask is that you find the light, the love and the lessons and everything you want. Hmm. You find the light, the love, and the lessons. And so if you, if, if a Ferrari does it for you or money does it for you, you may want to keep, look, my whole motto is make a lot of money, help a lot of people, have a lot of fun. I just have learned the light, the love, and the lessons, what to do with the money. It's still hyper important. I thought money was the end. I attached all my emotions to, man, when I'm rich, I'm going to be so happy. No, not if I shop for the wrong things and didn't learn the lessons, you know, drugs, alcohol, cars, boats, planes, all the stupid stuff that you don't need, different things you don't need to oppress other people. But when I learned I could build villages in Africa and give kids scholarships to college and elevate others and build businesses and provide jobs and give food and insurance and all health care, all these great things to people, man, I want money more than ever. I don't think you give to receive as i did in the past i believe i receive with full intent to give i receive to allow everything to come through me i have come from nowhere to now here and someday i'll end up nowhere but i will give my life away i will give my life away that's why i'm here oh man you know i, I learned this lesson two or three years ago. And I can't remember where I picked it up. It may have been Tony Robbins who may have mentioned it because Evan and I went to a, an Unleash the Power Within together. But um, those who have more can give more, right? And and I, I used to have money issues myself, of course, but those who have more can give more. And that's, and that's maybe it's money, but it's also time and it's also energy and skills and focus and resources and ability and everything. Uh, and so I think that's the most amazing thing. Did you, do you attribute everything that you're learning now and, and everything that you're sharing now to growing older and maturity and, and, and having the opportunity to lose a hundred million dollars and, and learn some hard lessons? And do you think for people who are younger or, or maybe focused on the wrong things, can they actually learn this lesson without making the mistakes or without slightly or just being older and having a different perspective on life. I think that depending on how many mistakes you accelerate through determines how quickly you pick up on the fact that you don't have to make the mistakes yourself. Uh, encompassing everything that I believe in is radical humility, not taking myself so seriously, understanding I don't know what I don't know. I think if I would have been more aware of all the mistakes and understanding that I don't have to make those mistakes. So there is a blend of what you're saying. And the, the blend that I would articulate to everyone is if you can make as many mistakes as you can until you get to a point where you realize you don't have to make the mistakes yourself. So in essence, you're half right. You just can't 
there's not just little Buddhas being born. It's like, oh yes, I'm not supposed to put my hand in the fire because it's burning me. It's my dad was right. I just got burned. I don't want to do that again. And then when we end up sticking our hands in fires 10, 20, 30 times, it depends on your own awareness of when you become more like a Buddha. And finally you do, you become humble and say, I don't have to keep sticking my hand in the fire. Maybe I should listen to people that sit in a situation that I want to be in and evaluate how it's aligned, synergistic or supplementary to my own values and experience. I have what I call a five daily practices. And the first daily practice is take inventory of your values. So I try to train people every day to know what they want personally, experientially, giving wise and receiving wise. And the first rule of taking them into your values is don't be afraid of being a hypocrite. Don't be afraid of changing your mind. Don't be afraid of meaning you don't know what you don't know. Don't be afraid of saying I changed, I grew, I accelerated to a better point, which leads to the second daily practice, which is know your who, because the fastest way to get to what you want or who or where you want is to find someone that already has it and ask for directions. But it takes radical humility to ask, and it takes even more radical humility to listen. I, I, I love that. It's amazing. So as we look forward, I, I play this game where I go, okay, gosh, if, if I think about 2016 mark five years ago 2016 mark man i don't like that guy why was he doing that he's me you know what was what a waste of so then i play this game where i go okay what, what is 2026 mark going to be really mad at me for not doing right now and and so what what should we be doing what should all of us be doing right now to make sure that, again that we are prepared for those really tough challenges that will come because life will throw them at us whether we want them or not we have to prepare ourselves and armor up. What should we be focused on? Yeah, if you want to make God laugh, come up with a well-developed plan, especially a five-year plan. Uh, you'll make him laugh for sure. Uh, but what we should be doing to prepare is, one, understand what we have control of, our mindset. So we have to continue to develop the tools of the mind in order to officiate the gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and inspiration to be able to utilize a muscle that I call consistency, utilize a muscle called persistency that we must be what we can be to pursue our potential, utilize a muscle of refocus. You know, I believe uh, thoroughly that we need to practice refocusing, that the human mind can only focus in on one thing and we need to focus in on what we want, not what we don't want, not what's missing, not what other people want for us, but what we want. And when we don't focus in on what we want, we need to practice the muscle of refocusing back on what we want. You can only focus your mind on one thing. So the faster you can refocus, the more statistically successful you'll be. But beyond taking control of that mindset and understanding where that is, is taking inventory of our capabilities through our heart set and our conscious continuum. What does that mean? That everyone has different capabilities within the conscious, subconscious, and their quantum being. So, for example, I have a capability of playing basketball, but not to the same potential as LeBron James, no matter how much I practice. And so what I want everyone to think about is, what are my skills? What are my knowledge of who and what? Not just what, what's my knowledge of who? And what is my desire aligned with my potential? Right? So I can desire to be the NBA player, but at five, seven, short, white, Jewish, not very good, I only have such a potential. Would I be better off utilizing my time, energy, and emotion towards maybe being a great inspirational speaker, author, writer, podcast host, TV executive producer, whatever it is that in the context of my quantum being that I'm better than LeBron James at? or maybe I'm not, but I'm the best of myself and it reaches higher potential. Why? Because for the future, align your capabilities, your skills, your knowledge and desire with what's doing well today. Mm. Do a cognitive analysis of what's doing well today. How do my skills, my knowledge and my desire align with it? How's it synergistic to it, supplementary to it? How can I utilize my skills, knowledge, and desire with what's doing well today? Secondly, what's stable today? And then thirdly, what I think is gonna do well in the future? And rub a little of that gratitude, 
kindness, forgiveness, uh, accountability into that mix would allow you to enjoy the process, the consistent, persistent pursuit of what's doing well, what's stable and what you think is going to do well. And if you don't know where to find it, which is the most common question people say, let me tell you, it's really easy. I go to the stock market, right? Stock market. I look for the industries, the careers, the jobs, the businesses that are doing well. And I see how my capabilities are doing aligned with those companies in the stock market, the top 50 performers in the careers, jobs, industries, et cetera. Then I go to the stock market and look at what hasn't moved in five years, even though there's been a pandemic. And I say, hmm, those jobs, careers, industries, they seem pretty stable. And then I go ahead and I study just everything that I know to determine from my situation, knowledge, experience, and my experts, my mentors, my coaches. And there is a difference, by the way, between a coach and a mentor. People ask me all the time, it's not $500 an hour, so don't buy that BS. The difference between a coach and a mentor is a coach will bring the best out of you. A mentor will give the best of what's inside of them to you. And so a coach doesn't necessarily have to know more or be better at what you're doing, but a coach will bring the best out of you. A mentor does need to know more and have more to give uh, than you already have experienced yourself. So if you can get to your capability, skills, knowledge, desire, align it synergistically and supplementary to what's doing well, what's stable and what will be doing well, you align with these values and daily practices, man, you will love where you're at. You, every day you'll say, I don't need anything else, but I'm going to do everything I can with the law of Goya. Get off my an angle to what I want, indicated by pain. I'm going to keep learning and growing. But most importantly, it's going to accelerate my faith that I'm going to end up somewhere better in the future than I am today. Yes. Yes, that was a short conversation with David, but man, did he drive a lot of value. Loved it. Okay, key takeaways. Number one, take inventory of your values because they will help ground you in whatever position you're in right now. And they're gonna help you stay grounded in wherever it is you're going. Number two, do not live with a victim mentality. You have to live in a philosophy of gratitude, forgiveness, and accountability. And number three, take inventory right now of your capabilities. Don't overestimate what you can do, but don't underestimate what you have done seeing where you are, and then keep moving forward. Remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show the world and, and we can show ourselves up here that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have to think big. You've got to be bold. And then you must say yes. If you're ready to learn how to get done. You've got to hear the conversation I had with this entrepreneur. Click on the link right over there. I did that. I submitted a hundred resumes and I got one response back. Those are like the two or five minutes a day when you're sitting there with warm waters and you're really in the moment and you're not in chaos. 